I was born in Beirut, Lebanon. My father was U.S. cultural attache to the American embassy, but that was really just his cover. He was really working for the Central Intelligence Group, which was the immediate predecessor to the Central Intelligence Agency. I would later learn that he was really one of America's first master spies in the Middle East. He died when I was an infant. I was six weeks old. He had been on a top secret mission to Saudi Arabia. He took a plane to Ethiopia and it crashed in Ethiopia and he died. So I moved to the United States and we grew up in a little town, my father's hometown of Winchester, Massachusetts. And that's where I had a very normal childhood life. But when I was 16 years old, my mother asked me if I wanted to go back to Lebanon because she missed it. The last two years of my high school were in Beirut. And then I went back to Beirut after college and getting a master's degree in art history, of all things, in Italy. Uh, my mother died. Uh, when I was in my early 20s, and so I figured I want to go back to Beirut. I'm pretty sure that the experience of living in the Middle East was a factor for me when I finally decided to take up the challenge of running for attorney general and then deciding to hold George W. Bush accountable for the war in Iraq. It was that, and it was also, of course, feeling very troubled by the fact that our young people were sent, being sent off to a war that had been sold to the American people on false pretenses. That disturbed me greatly. Our troops being sent off to war, believing that they were going there to protect the United States. And I imagine quite a number thought they were avenging 9-11. And these were lies. These were lies that had been told to them by their president. It happened that a friend of mine put a copy of Vincent Bugliosi's book in my hands, The Prosecution of George W. Bush for Murder. And there is a section in the book that says that any district attorney or any attorney general can prosecute Bush. And I thought, I'm running for attorney general. I'd already decided to run before uh, she even gave me the book. And I was considering what the issues were going to be. And then when I read that any attorney general could do this, I thought, well, I'm not an attorney general yet, but I could make it part of my campaign. I was able to meet Vincent, and we just hit it off. And then he started explaining to me what was both the evidence for why he, he believed that without a shadow of a doubt he could prove that uh, Bush had taken us to war on false pretenses and that he could also prove the argument of murder. A lot of people think that you can't go after a president at all, that the president has immunity. The president has immunity while he's in office. But when he's outside of office, he's like you or me. He's, an, he's just a regular citizen. I looked through the book looking at both the, the evidence and then the legal framework for prosecuting Bush. The legal framework was challenging, to say the least because George W. Bush hadn't even set foot in Vermont. And I knew that there would be people asking, how is it possible to prosecute him when he didn't pull the trigger? And of course, many people wanted to know why Bush would be actually uh, indicted for murder if he didn't step in and, uh, to Vermont and, and probably didn't intend to kill soldiers when he sent them off to war. This is something that I wanted to explore more with Vincent Bugliosi before I decided to take this up. He had said that journalists had established the evidence of the crime. They had written a great deal about the uh, taking troops to war on false pretenses, and yet they would write their stories and move on to the next story. And this troubled him. He thought some, somehow somebody should stand up and take a stand. So Vincent was able to change his schedule and come up to Vermont and be with me when I had a press conference announcing that I was going to run for Attorney General. I made my announcement and I said, I have a special guest here, Vincent Bugliosi, and although this is not the only subject that I'm going to run on, uh, the prosecution of George W. Bush will be, part, will be one of the issues that I will be addressing, and should I succeed, I intend to appoint Vincent Bugliosi as my special prosecutor. 
I found that the press reaction to my campaign was initially very fair, but then it just disappeared. This was difficult because every time I tried to challenge the incumbent, uh, he was allowed to have the last word, and his last word was that Vermont did not have jurisdiction. It could never happen in Vermont, he said. And no matter how hard I tried to counter him and actually explain the legal mechanisms whereby the President of the United States, once out of office, could actually be indicted in the state of Vermont, no one wanted to hear it. The elections happened, and I'll always remember that night because I got the news that I had lost the election. And mind you, I was running in a four-way race. So uh, it didn't come as a huge surprise to me. I was disappointed, obviously. But it was the same night that Obama won the election. And, and I was glad about that. I, students swarmed down to the, from the University of Vermont, just filled the streets. And I'd never seen anything like that. That suggested to me that there was a lot of pent-up emotion that I hadn't even been aware of from students. But one thing I can tell you is that I had heard from people all over the country during my campaign. In fact, I think I counted every single state. There was somebody emailing me, telling me how proud they were that I had done this race, how distressed they were that they, they felt they were losing their democracy, and how anxious they were that uh, President Bush and his advisors, his closest advisors, who got us involved in this illegal war, be held to account. And then there was the additional issue, which was the torture issue. This began to loom very large at around the very time that Obama became inaugurated. Because these issues were so deeply felt, I began to think that my quest for justice was not over yet, that maybe it was just beginning. I felt like someone has to report about this intense emotion because folks may recall that when President Obama was asked how he intended to deal with the crimes of the past administration, he said, I prefer to move forward rather than moving backward. And a lot of people did not share that belief. As a matter of fact, when he won the election and then put up a website and asked people what were their number one wishes. The criminal investigation and prosecution of George W. Bush, Bush Cheney, and others was number one on the list. I'm, I'm wondering if the Democratic Party leadership really knew how to handle that. It must have surprised them. It didn't surprise me one bit. By February, when Obama was, what, two months into office, a poll had been done, a Gallup poll, that showed that well over uh, two-thirds of the respondents wanted some kind of criminal investigation. And I think 40% wanted prosecution. And that was pretty strong evidence of the sentiment of the American people. So then the whole question was, what was going to happen? And I became very wrapped up in this. What was the president going to do? What was his attorney general going to do, Eric Holder? Was, was, was Obama sending a signal that he would move forward, because he did have a lot of big issues on his plate, the economy being huge, uh, and probably an escalation in Afghanistan. But he kind of left it open as to whether uh, the Department of Justice would, in fact, do justice, do its job, and take up a prosecution. And uh, in the uh, early days of the Obama administration, uh, Attorney General Holder did indicate that if he felt that the facts warranted, that he would look at it very carefully. So then, uh, what I ended up doing is deciding to write a book at this point. And, I, and so really, the whole second half of the book is my chronicling how the Obama administration is going to deal with the crimes of the Bush administration. And one of the things I learned is that um, there was tremendous amount of protest out there. There were demonstrators wearing their orange jumpsuits who were protesting outside the White House, outside the Supreme Court, and in various states, demanding that Guantanamo be closed down, insisting upon transparency, 
I grew up, as I think many Americans did, believing in and cherishing our democracy and freedom of press and freedom of speech. These were constitutional issues that we, we dearly loved, and we thought this is what made America exceptional. And suddenly, we are living in a country that we don't even recognize. That bothered not only me deeply, but many Americans. This is not the America that we know, that sends troops off to war in such a premeditated fashion, that tortures people, that spies on Americans, because we had learned there had been a lot of illegal surveillance. So I felt like I needed to address those questions. And I, I was really sort of going out into the world of, of um, trying to hold our government officials accountable, connecting with other people, chronicling what other people were doing. And that's why the subtitle of the book is about uh, my trying to bring the president uh, to justice and encountering this whole grassroots movement. But the thing that, that was most interesting to me is that the grassroots movement was not visible. And then again, just watching how Obama came into office promising transparency, promising that this was going to be a clean sweep and everything was going to change. And I started out feeling that this was very exciting. One of the first things that he did was also to strengthen the Freedom of Information Act, which is very valuable both to uh, journalists and to lawyers and had been very much uh, restricted under Bush. So I was glad about that. And I, um, so that's what happens. I start to chronicle what happens when Obama comes into power. I'm still reaching out to these different groups and discovering new groups all the time. I'm learning that the press isn't covering them. And I'm, I'm basically going on a journey uh, for accountability. And it came a time when I realized that there was a movement here. And as, as a matter of fact, not long after my loss, uh, before, right before I decided to write a book, I traveled down to Massachusetts and I stopped off at the Massachusetts School of Law and I went in and talked to the dean, Lawrence Velvel. He had been very instrumental in putting the conference together that was bringing lawyers from all over the world to, to see if they could prosecute war crimes committed by officials in the United States. After the elections, I went to him and I said, look, I feel like I let you down. I let my voters down. I mean, I didn't win, but I wanted you to know that I, I gave it my best shot and I did connect with a lot of people. And he was really very, very kind and very understanding. And what he said to me was, that's how all, all movements start that way. They start small. He says, I cannot tell you how many disappointments and losses I've had in my life, but I keep going. And if you look at the uh, women's movement, or actually I guess he started out by saying the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the women's movement, labor movements, they all started small. But eventually they gained speed. And so don't be discouraged. That was really helpful to me as I embarked on this uh, quest. And at some point, I mentioned the accountability movement, but I think others had mentioned it. Somehow this name just happened. And I can't attribute it to any one person, but that's what it became. And now what I'm finding out is that it's a, it's a word that rings, uh, even beyond the whole question of, uh, sending troops to war on a lie or torturing people. People are, are, are now wanting to hold um, their elected officials on a local level accountable for what they do. And uh, they want uh, accountability um, in health care. And so uh, I think it has the potential of spreading at the very time when uh, the, the powers that be seem to be pushing down against us and acting with impunity. The American people, I strongly believe, will only take it so far and they start pushing backwards. And uh, there was, I might say, a, uh, a period of, let's say, suspension after Obama was elected. People were tired. They wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt. Uh, but then when they began to realize that there were certain areas that he was not holding up to his promises. I think they were initially shocked, and I believe now that people are starting to take action again. By the time I had interviewed leaders in the 
what I now call the accountability movement from around the country, I realized that what I needed to do was to put them and their organizations in an appendix in the back of the book so that this book could be used as a handbook. It would guide citizens to the different groups that are dealing with the accountability movement, and it would, in a way, serve as a call to action. That is, that many different groups were acting in isolation. What I want with my book is to pull them together, and that's why I did a fair amount of work even on the uh, appendix, listing what, 10 pages of different organizations. And these range from uh, legal organizations to human rights organizations to anti-war organizations and um, civil libertarians, um, average community groups, all dealing with the issue. And I'm also going, I keep finding new groups. It just amazes me. So uh, there's no room in the book now. Uh, unless we get a second edition. So what I'm doing is I'm putting the, the names up on my website, peoplevbush.com, and that way uh, people can find a, a group near them that is concerned about accountability. I've also got on my website a, a sort of how to prosecute a president frequently asked questions so that if they want to try to find a district attorney in their area, uh, then I sort of show them the ropes, what they can expect, how, how to convince a, a prosecutor to go forward. We do have one person that is interested, but um, until it's absolutely nailed down, um, I'm certainly still looking for a district attorney or an attorney general that's going to carry forward on this mission. I say in the preface of the book, that most people agree that we have lived through eight years of a rogue presidency. But what is to prevent another rogue presidency from coming back? This is a deep concern I have. I feel, and many others join me in this feeling, that if we do not hold the uh, people in the Bush administration accountable for the crimes that they committed, committed in office, it will continue. The impunity will continue, and it will come back to haunt us. I think that what happened recently in Massachusetts, where a, uh, the Democrat lost her seat, Senator Kennedy's seat, to a Republican, is in a way a warning to many people that we could have another uh, very, very conservative Republican administration right back if we don't step up to the plate and insist on accountability. So that, that holds for President Obama, too. We, we have now turned a corner and we are saying no more age of impunity. We want our government officials to respect the rule of law.